We Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 16. Gorman crouched alongside Bridgman and peered out into the grey light of the seventh day. Six times they had stood to at night, and this was the sixth morning on which he had seen the sun rise east of Arnhem, coming up out of Germany as a signal for the day's killing to begin. For the first time for many days there was a complete silence, a hushed silence as if two opponents had agreed to a short truce while each recovered his wind. Gorman felt sure their positions would be attacked at some time during the day ahead. He had watched a pattern slowly reveal itself in the German tactics. They were hitting the perimeter continually at platoon, company and battalion strength, each attack supported by a few tanks and self-propelled guns. They were seeking to reduce and overrun the division's positions individually, blowing them out of one position, burning them out of another, as the day before they had burned the houses over the heads of the battered remnants of the 10th Para Battalion. They kept up a continuous shelling and mortaring of the whole area within the perimeter, making movement of any kind nearly impossible. Since the contraction of the perimeter on the night of the fifth day, the Germans had hit every unit in the division except the independent company. On their front, the enemy had patrolled and probed at each of the platoons in turn. First at three platoon in the school, and then at his own. Gorman was sure that the lone tank which Summers had knocked out on the previous afternoon had lost its way, and was probably trying to rejoin or join up with some larger force. It had blundered into their positions and been knocked out before the crew had even realised they were in danger. The Germans had closed right up to one platoon, so that they now held the houses on the opposite side of the road. Gorman felt his breath catch in his throat at the thought of their predicament. Ramsden's men must be continually keyed up to breaking point. They would have to crawl from room to room on their bellies, never daring to raise their heads above window level, except to take a snapshot or a quick look at the enemy. Gorman guessed, however, they would have several men in the roofs so that they could, to some extent, dominate the Germans and prevent them from subjecting the men lower down in the houses to a too accurate fire. Gorman's eyes wandered to the houses held by Murray, and back to the three at the far end of the road. The Germans were in some part of these houses, and they were dug in in the open gardens in front of three platoon. Bridgman had taken a patrol out during the night while Murray had been fixing his tank trap, and he had been halted or fired at from a number of points, all within 70 or 80 yards of the two platoons. Gorman sneaked to look at Bridgman's face. It showed as much strain and tiredness as any of the other faces in the platoon. Gorman thought it showed something else as well, something he'd noticed in Marsden's and Cassidy's faces. It was hard to define exactly what it was that showed through the tight skin and brightened the dulled bloodshot eyes. It was not fanaticism, and dedication was too high-flown a word to describe whatever it was that drove them beyond limits which most men would have accepted. Gorman wondered why, unconsciously, he had instinctively included Cassidy with Bridgman and Marsden. Cassidy was another of the German Jews. He was a member of Murray's section, and thinking about him now, Gorman realised that he had hardly seen him since the initial landings. He was a man who soldiered on quietly from day to day, barely betraying his general dissatisfaction with the conduct of the war, but every now and again he exploded into quick, decisive action which took others by surprise. These actions were, more often than not, ones which placed him in a position of some danger, but courage alone was not the answer to the question which nagged at Gorman's mind. There were many brave men in the platoon, but their acts of bravery were a kind he could understand more readily than the behaviour of Bridgman, Marsden and Cassidy. Gorman's attempt to find the common factor which inspired the three men was interrupted by the sound of armoured vehicles moving somewhere out of sight, round the bend in the road above them. He felt rather than heard the rustle of movement above him and in the house next door. He glanced towards Murray's houses and saw a man signalling to him from a back window. He was signalling armour and something else that Gorman couldn't make out. He tugged at Bridgman's smock sleeve. The platoon commander followed the direction of Gorman's hand, staring for what seemed wasted seconds. Then he was on his feet and heading for the door. He called softly over his shoulder as he went. Tanks in the open ground beyond McEwen. For Christ's sake, hold them here. Gorman caught one more glimpse of Bridgman as he crossed the road and disappeared into the house, held by McEwen and his half-section. Two tanks and a self-propelled gun were turning the corner at the top of the road even as Gorman looked back. No one fired. Gorman tried to make up his mind quickly whether it was the best for all guns to hold off or whether it had been better for one MG to have worried the armour, keeping them tight sealed and half blind. As he wondered, a gun opened up from Murray's house. The leading tank hunkered up behind the knocked out Mark IV, its gun swinging lazily round to its left. 
The SP kept on along the still clear left-hand side of the road, its gun pointing straight at Gorman's position. As it drew level with the Mark IV, Summers fired his first bomb. It struck the SP, exploding high up on its thick armoured front. The second bomb hit its left-hand track and it slewed round in that direction, effectively blocking the road. The leading tank fired its first shell at Murray's position as Gorman spotted the German infantry spilling out from the gardens round the houses at the end of the road. As he fired at the darting grey figures, he heard all the MGs in the two sections' positions open fire. Both tanks were firing now, and the crippled SP's gun swung back till Gorman thought he was staring down its gaping muzzle. When it fired, he felt the house he was in lift as if it had been jerked off its foundations. He was thrown sideways and finished up in a heap on the floor. He scrambled to his feet and crouched by the open window. Looking out, he saw Murray and Cassidy halfway across the road in front of him. Cassidy was in the lead and Murray at a limping run close at his heels. Each man carried one of the ugly gammon bombs in his right hand. They threw themselves behind the cover of the derelict tank which separated them from the newer one behind it. The two tanks and the SP were all firing. Gorman felt the spatter of German small arms fire against the walls of the house and then the building was hit by another shell and he was on the floor for a second time with a great lump of the ceiling on top of him, the taste of blood in his mouth and the sting of plaster in his eyes. He sat up as the house rocked again. He tore the plaster away from his body and rubbed it from his eyes. He crawled back to the window and saw Cummings sprawled grotesquely over the spandau, blood seeping from his nostril. He looked dead. Gorman raised his sten and fired at a patch of grey that showed by a garden wall. He looked round for further movement. The German infantry had been forced into the cover of the gardens on each side of the road. Four of them lay out in the open, two of them moving slightly, and the other two lying very still. He saw Murray fire his sten under the belly of the Mark IV, and as he fired, another Piet bomb hit the self-propelled gun on the right of the road. Three of its crew jumped out and started to run back. Gorman put a burst into the back of the one nearest him and saw the man throw up his arms as the weight of metal hit him between the shoulder blades. A second German was either hit or fell. He turned at once and faced the British position, squatting on his haunches, his hands raised above his head. The third man, incredibly, ran straight up the road for 40 yards and disappeared from sight without being hit. A movement pulled Gorman's gaze back, and he saw Cassidy leap out from his position beside Murray and hurl his bomb at the tank sheltering behind the wretched Mark IV. Before it exploded, he was back behind the derelict again. Gorman waited, not quite sure what he was waiting for. The farther tank had retreated to the end of the road, and now only half of its turret was visible. This and one track, together with the barrel of its gun, showed at the bend in the road. He could see very little of the tank behind the wrecked one, but suddenly it moved, lurching out into the road between the SP and the Mark IV. It crabbed its way round, grinding on a locked track, then it set off away up the road, gathering speed as it went. As it turned at the top, another bomb from Summers' Piet hit where its turret joined its body, Two seconds later, it was out of sight, the remaining tank backed away, and the threat was over. Gorman watched the gardens on each side of the road, one half of him listening to the strange new silence that had come down like a blanket over the platoon's positions, the other taking in the firing from the borders' trenches a thousand yards behind him, and the burst of the mortar bombs exploding behind the Hartenstein Hotel. Although he had been waiting for it, he was caught unaware by the speed with which the German soldiers burst out from the cover of the houses on the right of the road. But they were not the SS of the fourth day's assault, and the attack died before it began. As the platoon's machine guns opened fire, the German infantry wilted and made for the gaps on the left of the road. Their rush carried many of them beyond the protection of the houses, and within seconds of their disappearance, Gorman heard three platoon's guns open up, and he knew the Germans had been caught in the open ground in front of Brown's men. He watched Murray and Cassidy make their way back to the cover of their houses. Gorman looked at Cummings. He decided he was dead, but he had to make sure. He eased himself away from the window and started to crawl across to where the other man lay. But before he had completed his first cramped movement, the German multiple mortars opened fire and the bombs fell on and about the house. They burst in the road where the tanks and the dead men lay. The clatter of fragmented steel beat against brick and tile and tarmac and the moaning whine of the bombs in the air filled his ears. He stopped and turned back, crouching hunched up behind the breastwork of the window, his head bent and his hands clasped behind the back of his neck. He found himself trying to count the number of explosions, but it was impossible. 37, or was it 47? The bombs were still falling, faster it seemed. Bullets sprayed into the wall behind him. He looked back under his bent arm and watched the dust falling from the chipped plaster. This was no good. Anything could be happening outside. He crawled back to the corner of the window and raised his body slowly. 
He spotted the muzzle flash of a German gun in one of the houses at the end of the road and bullets whipped into the room within inches of his head. The firing from the house on his left and from the room below him was continuous and he sensed rather than picked out the exchanges from where Murray's men fought back. He wanted very much to join Fraser and Hardy or the two Yorkshiremen and he half started for the door but stopped himself and changing direction crawled over to Cummings. Yes, he was dead, and as Gorman struggled to move the soggy weight of his body which imprisoned the Spandau, he remembered the visit Cummings's young wife had made to the Lincolnshire village where the company had been billeted. He had thought the girl attractive and intelligent, and he had resented her too obvious adulation of a man who was, after all, only a very average member of the unit. Cummings's body fell back against the wall, his mouth opening slowly as if the hinges of his jaw were clogged with dirt. With his hand on the Spandau, Gorman looked into the dead soldier's face, the live eyes and the dead only a few inches apart. He tried to remember what else he knew about Cummings, but there was nothing. A young soldier who now had a widow, and that was all. He crawled back with the Spandau, feeling ashamed inadequacy at his lack of knowledge of a man he had soldiered with for years. Cautiously he raised his head and saw that another German tank, a big one, had crept into sight at the bottom of the road. As he looked, it erupted into flames, but the exultation died in him before he could savour it. The tank had not been hit, it was equipped with a flamethrower, and as Gorman watched a great tongue of fire licked out and burst like a bomb, spreading round the walls and windows of the empty third house on the right of the street. The flame ran back to the tank, dribbling weakly as it died. Then it belched again the hot vomit of its blast enveloping the second house, the one which held half of Murray's men. Gorman fired the Spandau, and firing, he found himself trembling with a mixture of suppressed rage and despair. He fired into the flame, wondering whether it was possible for his bullets to find a weak point, some part of the armoured mass that was vulnerable. The flame ran back for a second time. When it burst out again, it seemed to him that a great ball of fire filled the whole of his vision, blotting out the houses and the sky and everything around him. He felt heat such as he had experienced only once before, when he had stood well back at the opening of a furnace. He felt his breath catch and dry up in his lungs. He was flat on the bedroom floor, his hands clawing at the floorboards, his mouth open and his throat choking. The heat died away and he raised himself slowly. He snatched a look through the empty window frame. The tank was going back, it was already half out of sight. He listened intently, hearing a cry faintly from the room below him. He stared out, accepting the lack of activity and the stillness as only a temporary reality. He made for the door, crab-like on booted toes and knuckled hands. At the top of the stairs, he straightened up, steeling himself for what he was likely to find. First, he must be sure he'd been in the room below him. They'd changed round quite a bit. Summers and Woodley would be in the bedroom of the next house, with Mocock and Lydon resting in its kitchen. At least, they would have been resting until the firing started. It would have been Roy Fraser and Tony Hardy. He stopped at the bottom of the stairs, one hand resting on the banisters. He could smell burning paint, and the air in the narrow hall hung dead about him, a devitalised cloak of the intangible, the life-giving oxygen burned out of it. Moving to the front of the house, he saw the reflection of flames through the half-open door, and the faint cry he had heard from above became a continuous wailing succession of sobs. He pushed the door back on its hinges and looked in. The torn-down curtains were burning where they had been flung in one corner of the room, and two armchairs were smouldering, occasional flames darting like spiders across their brocade. The walls were seared and the paint on the window sill swelled and popped in soft bubbles. The two men were by the wall on the left. Gorman stamped the fire out of the curtains and beat at the armchairs with his smocked sleeve. Then he turned to the bulked camouflage bundles by the wall. As he bent down, the nearer bundle turned and Gorman found himself looking into the white, unmarked face of Hardy. The dirty bandage round his head showed like a sepoy's khaki turban. I was halfway up the stairs when they fired the flamethrower. Hardy's voice was high but steady on a single note of rigid control. He dare not risk an inflection for fear his voice would escape him and race away. When I got down it was over. Look. Gorman looked and at first he didn't know what he saw. What he had known of Roy Fraser was gone. Where his fair fastidious face had been was something beyond horror. It was impossible for Gorman to take in and appreciate what had been done to the other man. He simply looked at the smouldering smock, at the shriveled veil round the neck, and at the hand twisted and crooked like a chicken's claw which groped and jerked on the chest. Gorman heard himself breathing harshly through an open mouth. I'll get Brogan. He halted at the door and asked, Are you all right? Hardy nodded. 
Then slowly, letting his glance linger on the window, taking in the sky and the outside air with its less strongly flavoured scent of death, he turned at last to look down at the blacker gap in the blackened face of his friend. He spoke softly. Frank's gone for broken, he won't be long. Hold on until he gets here, Roy. The long, broken succession of sobs had stopped, and out of the lipless cavity came a word repeated over and over. Please, please, please. As Hardy remembered his morphia and reached for it, he had to wipe the sweat from his eyes so that he could see. With his knife, he cut through Fraser's smock, tunic and shirt. He unscrewed the top of the little tube, pierced the seal and screwed the needle on. And as he made the injection in his friend's upper arm, he realised that no amount of morphia could wipe out Roy's pain, and the plea beat into his head. Please, please, Tony, please. Gorman and Brogan waited inside the stable behind the angle of the wall. The falling mortar bombs threw the black garden earth high into the air between them and the house where Hardy and Fraser waited. Brogan was ready to risk the short run, but Gorman stopped him. There was no point in risking death for a dead man, and he knew no man could survive the burns he had seen on Fraser. The bombs stopped falling in the garden, and after a minute or two of silence, the sounds of their burst started again between Blake's house and divisional headquarters this time. Gorman wondered where they were being fired from. The perimeter was now so tight that the German mortars could be sighted anywhere at all, on the Arnhem side where the platoon faced, or on the far side, beyond the border regiment. Any point within the perimeter was within range of mortar firing from near its limits. They waited for some moments to make sure that the Germans had genuinely changed targets, and while they waited they heard one short burst from the section post, and then silence. Whoever fired had either found his target, or it was a false alarm. When Gorman and Brogan entered the room, they found Hardy behind the Spandau. Roy's dead, he said, and turned his face quickly away from them. Brogan bent over Fraser's body. Hardy was right, he was dead. He looked closer, pulling down the zip on the dead man's smock and opening his shirt. When he stood up, he didn't turn at once, but stood looking down at the dead man. At last he looked round, his eyes flicking over Hardy's averted face until they met Gorman's. Hardy's right. He's dead. Shock. If it was me, I'd be glad.